it, Tech. What's this tool for? It's used to hold the transmission throttle lever in the minimum pressure position while you adjust the throttle rod, Dan. Is throttle linkage adjustment all that important? Oh, you better believe it. Throttle pressure adjustment has always been very important. But it's even more important on the 1971 torque flights. But it looks like Charlie's finished his lunch. And since he's an expert on torque flight, maybe he'll give you the lowdown on shift quality and linkage adjustments. I'm not much of an after-dinner speaker, but uh, for after lunch, I'll give it a whirl. Before I try and explain shift and throttle linkages, I better make sure you understand what goes on inside a torque flight transmission so you'll know how external adjustments affect shift performance. Does that mean I have to learn all about these hydraulic circuits in order to do a good job of adjusting torque flight linkages? Not at all, Dan. However, an understanding of the 2-3 shift valve, the throttle valve, and the manual valve will help you to understand how and why external adjustments affect shift quality. I think I know what the manual valve does. It routes pressure to the shift valve so that the right bands and clutches are applied or released for the gear range selected. I figure it's kind of like a hydraulic switch. And I can understand why you might get into shift and slippage problems if the manual valve was misadjusted. What I don't understand is how the throttle and kickdown valves work and where throttle pressure comes in. Okay, Dan, I'll see if I can explain it. But I'll have to start with the shift valves. This is a greatly simplified representation of the 2-3 shift valve. Governor pressure pushes against the left end of the valve. Throttle pressure plus a spring push against the other end of the valve. Now, keep these two facts in mind. Governor pressure increases with car speed. Throttle pressure increases with throttle opening. So the shift valve is sort of balanced between governor pressure and throttle pressure. Actually, pressure at the left is applied to the governor plug, and it pushes the shift valve to the right. At the right, throttle pressure is applied to the end of the shift valve or to a downshift plug, depending on throttle opening. And this tries to push the valve to the left. We'll talk about those plugs later. When governor pressure is higher than throttle pressure, the shift valve moves to the right. This routes pressure to apply the front clutch and shifts the transmission into direct or high. Incidentally, in all forward gears, the manual valve routes pressure directly to apply the rear clutch. If governor pressure is low and throttle pressure is high, the shift valve moves to the left. Pressure applies the kick down band and the front clutch is released. This downshifts the transmission to second or keeps it from upshifting, as the case may be. Since governor pressure isn't an external service adjustment, but throttle pressure is easily adjusted, you adjust it to get the right relationship between the two. I'm beginning to get the picture, but what kind of problems does misadjustment cause? If throttle pressure is higher than it should be, upshifts will be delayed. They'll come at higher than normal shift speed. And shifts will be harsh, not as smooth as they should be. On the other hand, if throttle pressure is low, upshifts will be early at lower than normal shift speeds. Shifts will tend to be dragged out and mushy instead of smooth and crisp. And that's not the worst of it. Low throttle pressure results in abnormal slippage at the kickdown band and front clutch. If throttle pressure adjustment is off very much, you can expect abnormal wear and early failure of the friction material. Uh, speaking of kickdown, where does the kickdown valve come in? The throttle valve is actually controlled by the kickdown valve. The two are connected by a spring. When the accelerator is floored, the kickdown valve sends full throttle pressure to the shift valve. Pressure supplied from the kickdown valve moves the shift valve to the left and downshifts the transmission. Any questions so far? As a matter of fact, I, I do have a couple of questions. First, what prevents the transmission from kicking down at higher speeds? And second, how does the part throttle downshift work? Well, let's take full throttle kickdown first. At speeds that are above the kickdown range, governor pressure is higher than throttle pressure. In addition, the governor plug diameter is larger than the diameter of the shift valve. As a result, the hydraulic force trying to push the valve to the right is greater. Throttle pressure force is less.
That is why the valve doesn't move to the left and provide a kickdown shift at higher speeds. Now for question number two about part throttle downshift. All of our transmissions now have the downshift plug at the throttle pressure end of the 2-3 shift valve. The diameter of this plug is greater than the diameter of the shift valve. When the driver steps on the gas, throttle pressure on the downshift plug increases until it overcomes governor pressure. This moves the shift valve to provide a part throttle downshift at speeds below about 40 miles an hour. I can see now why throttle pressure adjustment is so important, but why should it be especially important on this year's models? There have been more changes and refinements on the 1971 torque flights than ever before. These changes result in very smooth shift quality. However, if the throttle rod adjustment is short, throttle pressure will be low and there is danger of excessive band and front clutch slippage. If the throttle rod is too long, shifts won't be as smooth as they should be. Okay, I'm sold on our torque flight transmissions and on the importance of correct throttle linkage adjustment. Now, I'm back to my first question. How do you use this tool? That special tool slips onto the end of the throttle lever shaft and the spring holds the throttle lever forward against its stop. There are several precautions and preliminary steps that apply to all models. What you're shooting for is minimum throttle pressure at curb idle and throttle linkage adjusted so you'll start to move the throttle lever at the transmission the minute you crack the throttle. Now to accomplish this, idle speed must be correct and the curb idle screw must be against its stop when adjusting throttle rod length. Make sure the engine is warmed up so that the fast idle screw is off the fast idle cam. If the car you're working on has a carburetor with a curb idle solenoid, turn on the ignition so that the solenoid stem will be extended and the throttle will actually be at curb idle. Now let's take a look at the simplest throttle linkage setup. This is the direct acting transmission throttle linkage used on some of our V8 models. At the carburetor end of the linkage, the slotted section of the rod rests against the carburetor throttle lever pin. Throttle rod adjustment is provided by a slip joint and lock screw arrangement. A spring pulls the entire linkage forward so that it follows the movement of the throttle lever pin as the throttle is opened. The lower end of the throttle linkage is connected to the transmission throttle lever. I have a question about the carburetor end of the linkage. Why does the throttle rod have that long slot in it? Now, it seems to me that a plain old round hole would be the easiest way to connect the linkage to the throttle lever pin. <laughs> There's a good reason for that long slot, Dan. If for any reason the transmission throttle linkage binds or gets stuck, that long slot lets the carburetor throttle lever and pin move forward. In other words, that slot eliminates the possibility of the transmission throttle linkage interfering with the closing of the throttle. And now, if someone will turn the record, Charlie will give you the lowdown on adjusting this linkage. As I said before, the throttle must be at curb idle choke open and fast idle cam off. If the carburetor has an idle stop solenoid, turn the ignition on so the throttle is at curb idle. Next, slip the special throttle lever tool onto the end of the throttle lever shaft and connect the spring to hold the lever forward against its stop. Incidentally, you may have to loosen the transmission throttle lever and move it down so that there's room enough on the end of the shaft to take the special tool. Once the tool is installed, loosen the throttle rod adjusting screw and adjust the linkage so that the rear of the slot rests against the pin on the carburetor throttle lever. This is an easy adjustment to make, providing you push everything in the right direction before you tighten the lock screw. You must hold the retainer forward so that the front link bottoms against the throttle pin. At the same time, push the rod rearward just enough to take all of the free play out of the linkage. Don't push so hard that you overcome the pull of the special tool spring. The easiest way to do this with only two hands is to squeeze the rod and the retainer between forefinger and thumb to take up all of the slack. At the same time, push forward on the retainer to bottom the slot against the pin while tightening the lock screw. Is it really that critical? It sure is, Dan. <laughs>
If you pull that rod forward to take all the free play out in that direction, instead of pushing it to the rear, you could wind up with a linkage that is as much as a half inch too short. That could cause slippage and damage to clutch and band facings. Just remember, it's better to have the throttle linkage a bit too long than it is to have it too short. Better yet, get it exactly right. It's easy enough if you know how. Next, let's look at a two-section linkage. This is the linkage used on models with six-cylinder engines. It has a slotted upper rod, a bell crank, and an adjustable lower throttle rod. In this setup, the upper throttle rod is connected directly to the carburetor throttle lever. The slot in the upper throttle rod contacts a pin in the bell crank that is part of the linkage. Contact between this pin and the slot is the point of reference for adjusting this linkage. A slip joint or link at the upper end of the lower rod provides the means of adjusting the length of the throttle rod. And here's how you go about making that adjustment. The preliminary precautions are the same for all throttle rod adjustments. Engine at curb idle and special tool installed at the transmission. Loosen the slip joint lock screw, then push the adjuster link forward while pushing the lower rod gently but firmly to the rear, just enough to remove all free play. Use thumb and forefinger to hold the adjuster link and the lower rod in this position while you tighten the lock screw. The six-cylinder linkage and the direct-acting linkage adjustments seem easy enough, but tell me, don't some of our eights have a more complicated setup? They sure do, Dan. The linkage used on some models with a 318 engine has three rods and two bell cranks. There's an adjustable upper rod, an upper bell crank, and an adjustable intermediate rod. At the transmission end of the linkage, the lower bell crank and lower rod complete the linkage connection to the transmission throttle lever. How come two rod adjustments are needed with this linkage? The upper rod is where the final throttle rod adjustment is made. The intermediate rod is always adjusted first, so that geometry of the two bell cranks will be correct. This is necessary because of dimensional variations between the transmission and the upper bell crank. Well, what happens if intermediate rod adjustment isn't right? If intermediate rod adjustment is wrong, either too long or too short, throttle pressure will be low for all throttle positions. Upshifts will come early and will be dragged out instead of crisp. The resulting slippage can burn up clutches and bands. Before adjusting the intermediate rod, slip a 3 16th rod through the index holes provided at the upper bell crank and install the special tool at the transmission. This establishes the correct geometry between the transmission and the upper bell crank. Adjust the length of the intermediate rod by turning the ball socket until it lines up with the ball on the bell crank. The ball socket must line up with the ball while pushing downward on the intermediate rod just firmly enough to remove all free play. Disconnect the intermediate rod spring, remove the retaining clip and washer, Remove the index pin and attach the ball socket to the bell crank. Do not remove the special tool from the transmission throttle lever shaft. Next, check the adjustment of the upper throttle rod. The rear of the slot should just touch the pin on the throttle valve lever, but it must not push on the pin hard enough to hold the throttle open above specified curb idle. On the other hand, the slotted section of the rod should not move away from the throttle lever pin when you push it toward the rear to remove all linkage free play. Here again, adjustment is checked with the tool installed at the transmission and all free play taken out by pushing the linkage toward the transmission. If the linkage is too long or too short, slip the slotted section off the pin and thread it on or off the rod until its length is correct. And that, my boy, takes care of throttle rod adjustment. I never realized how critical throttle rod adjustment was or, or how easy it would be to get it wrong if you didn't know what you were doing. Now, is there anything new on shift linkage adjustment? As a matter of fact, yes. The slave linkage has been eliminated on most models with console shift. The slave linkage is still used on full-size cars with console and torque flight. Doesn't the slave linkage have something to do with the steering column lock? 
Right then. On console models, the slave linkage moves the steering column shift tube and housing so that the steering wheel cannot be locked when the car is in motion. You can't turn the ignition key to lock unless the transmission is in park or in reverse for a manual transmission. The only drawback to a slave linkage is that it does increase shift effort. This is particularly undesirable on models with manual transmission. So the steering column has been redesigned to eliminate the shift tube and the need for a slave linkage. The shift housing on console shift models now has a device called an inhibitor. It inhibits the accidental locking of the steering column. Sounds like an oil additive. Now how does it work? You must push the inhibitor ring downward and hold it there while you turn the key to the lock position. The inhibitor does manually what the slave linkage does automatically. I can see how that works. But tell me, how does this affect torque flight shift linkage adjustment? It makes it easier because there isn't any slave linkage to adjust. Except for that, shift linkage adjustment is the same as for last year's models. The general rule on torque flight shift linkage adjustment is make sure the shift selector lever is in park when the transmission shift control lever is pushed all of the way to the rear so that it is in the park detent. To review briefly, on compact and intermediates, linkage adjustment is at a sliding swivel located at the inner end of the torque shaft. Challenger and Barracuda models also have a torque shaft, but the adjusting swivel is at the lever at the outer end of the torque shaft. Full-size models have an adjustable slotted joint in the front shift rod. Just remember that on all models from compacts to full-size, you loosen the slip joint or swivel, put the selector lever in park, push the control lever at the transmission to the rear, and tighten the adjustment. On console models having a slave linkage, you must adjust the shift linkage first. Then adjust the slave linkage last and double-check yourself by making sure the ignition key can be turned to the lock position when the shift selector is in park. Torque flight shift linkage adjustment seems simple enough. Is there anything new on manual transmission shift linkages? Nothing new except the elimination of the slave linkage on all manual transmission cars with floor shift. There is one little unrelated item on four-speed shift forks. The four-speed manual transmission now has a lever-type interlock, like the one introduced on the three-speed last year. This new shift housing assembly doesn't change the external linkage adjustment procedure in any way. However, if you try to install a four-speed transmission shift housing with both shifter forks in place, you'll probably go out of your tree before you find out that it can't be done that way. My advice is, Read this month's reference book and find out how to assemble that shift housing the easy way. And of course, the reference book includes everything we've talked about today. So keep it handy and get those torque flight throttle linkages adjusted the way they should be. See you all next month with some valuable up-to-date information on the cooling system and engine temperature control. <laughs>